My name is Simone Brooks. I'm an assistant city manager for the city of Hillsboro. And joining me tonight from Community Action are Pat Rogers, Housing and Homeless Services, Services Manager, and Cecilia Bonvino, Family and Community Resources Data and Reporting Manager. Also joining me are City of Hillsboro Senior Project Manager Justin DeMello and Project Homeless Connects Executive Director um, Kim Marshall. Um, so sorry, I didn't have their names up there. Um, tonight, we will briefly review the city's homelessness related initiatives. Um, we'll paint a picture of the state of homelessness in Hillsborough using data from the 2021 point in time um, homeless census or count and provide an update on the city's newest initiative to address homelessness, a temporary city sanctioned organized camp for up to 30 unhoused commu community members. Homelessness is a complex issue, and while it is not a new issue, it has become increasingly visible and impactful with many stakeholders and perspectives. City Council, as well as staff, have heard from numerous community members that Hillsborough's livability is suffering. Unsafe conditions, threats to the environment, such as garbage and poor sanitation, nuisance, criminal activity, and business disruption are frequent topics of complaints. Perhaps with equal frequency, we receive complaints about the lack of access to shelters and affordable housing, social services, and resources for our unhoused community members to meet even the most basic of needs, like a place to eat or find water or use a restroom or sleep. So the council has recognized that while homelessness is certainly a national, state, regional, and county problem, it is also very much a Hillsborough problem and has approved the investment of labor hours monetary and facility resources. <clears throat> so in terms of our, our current homelessness initiatives, um, most of you are already aware of these, but our code compliance team currently made up of six officers spends approximately 75% of its time responding to issues related to homelessness. That can vary anywhere between 50 to 90% of their time. So about 70 to 75%. We have two homeless liaisons as part of the crisis intervention team whose work takes them into the parks downtown and across the city. Our community enhancement team works with our economic development project manager to conduct outreach and engagement to better understand business and community concerns. Our code compliance CIT and CET team members participate annually in the point in time count about which you'll hear more shortly from Pat Rogers and Cecilia. In terms of funding between July 2019 and February 2021 of this year, the city provided more than $415,000 to support community-based organizations initiatives to address homelessness. One of the most impactful investments included a partnership with Community Action, Washington County and Project Homeless Connect to operate a winter weather shelter at the Hillsborough Civic Center. While it was open January 31st through March 15th, it served 68 people experiencing homelessness, operating during a time when our city experienced a snow event that endangered lives. Establishing the winter weather shelter um, drew both community support and criticism, and it drew attention to the city's need for a full-time staff person to lead our homelessness work. We are now in the final phases of the recruitment and selection of a community services program coordinator and look forward to having that position filled in the near future. With that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen um, so that uh, Pat can go ahead and hopefully I was sharing, but I have a stinking feeling I never did. Well, hopefully you understood what I was saying the whole time along. Yes, everybody following? That's amazing. Next time, I'm going to share my screen after Pat sh shares. So if I don't put it up, let just flag me down. So I'll, uh, I'll hand it over to Aubrey um, to help out Pat. Hello, and thanks for having me, uh, council members, Mayor Calloway and Simone. Uh, if Aubrey could bring up our PowerPoint, please. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about the uh, 2021 point in time homeless census or count. We conduct a homeless count every year in the month of January as mandated by HUD. Um, to receive uh, funds to 
serve homeless persons with HUD funds. Uh, each jurisdiction across the country must conduct a point in time count. So this presentation will cover um, a little bit about the planning process, a little bit about our methodology, uh, the actual findings uh, that resulted from the count, the data, and uh, we'll focus on both the number of unsheltered persons that we counted, uh, as well as the number of persons who presented as being homeless, uh, and entered the system and wound up in shelter or were in short to medium term rent assistance programs as a transition into permanent housing. Uh, next slide. So the planning, planning process really comes out of our year round street outreach, built for zero street outreach convening group. Um, that group uh, was created when the Belt for Zero campaign, campaign um, began back in December of 2019. Beginning in about uh, February of 2020, regular street outreach began to be conducted through contracted uh, service providers uh, in Washington County. Some of them include uh, Forest Grove Foundation, Home Plate Youth Services, uh, Just Compassion of East Washington County, New Narrative Mental Health Services, uh, Open Door Counseling Center, Central Cultural, uh, Project Homeless Connect, uh, and Community Action. In addition to that, we're supported by each of the municipal police departments, uh, beginning with Hillsboro uh, Police Officers, Mike Abishire, Abshire and Rich Matriciano, their sergeant, um, followed by uh, Beaverton Police, uh, started attending our group, uh, followed by Tiger Police. Uh, we now have Sherwood Police involved in regular discussions and street outreach and communications about uh, where camps are and homeless persons are located. And then um, we hope to have Forest Grove uh, involved with our group soon. Um, street Outreach Group um, identifies uh, coverage gaps in Washington County throughout the year. We conduct, uh, like I say, face-to-face -face contact regularly with uh, homeless persons throughout the county. We know where they're at. We know where homeless camps are springing up and we keep track of all that information. So the planning process for the point in time count naturally comes from that. Um, so, Pretty much during the um, July and August period of time, the um, Street Outreach Convening Group uh, debriefs the previous year's point in time count. We evaluate uh, some of the must haves for the upcoming count or the must do's. Um, then out of that around September and October, a steering committee is formed, uh, which is comprised of mostly the same group and the Street Outreach Committee and who are regularly conducting street outreach, but um, we find that it's necessary to create a separate meeting to effectively uh, conduct the planning process. So during the period of time between September and January 27th, uh, which is the official date of the 21 count, uh, we review the HUD guidance on um, what they expect from each jurisdiction across the country. Uh, pertaining to point time count. We settle on our methodology. Uh, we uh, settle on the type of collection tool we're going to use. In the past, that has been a paper uh, data collection tool on a clipboard uh, done through individual interviews with homeless persons. We determine the enumerator capacity requirements uh, that we think will be necessary in the upcoming count. Uh, we create a training curriculum uh, for all enumerators and a calendar for uh, how the count will unfold. Um, we identify the official point in time count date. Uh, so that can be any date in the last 10 days of January each year. And we also ensure that we have adequate coverage of the entire ge geographic area of Washington County. Uh, next slide. So 
So um, this year's count obviously was affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. And so our methodology had to include um, that um, we took into consideration uh, the, the safety concerns associated with the pandemic. Um, all street outreach staff, uh, because we conduct the work throughout the year, uh, we're used to wearing PPE. Uh, they are all trained and experienced in working with the homeless population. Uh, through street outreach activities and during the point in time count, we assess the wellness of our homeless population. We provide them with information on symptoms of COVID-19 and uh, we provide them with information around how to access COVID testing and where to find information on COVID vaccine availability. And after COVID testing uh, for the homeless population takes place, then there is a continuum that would place them in respite shelters. And the one last year that was set aside for COVID-19 um, positive folks in the homeless population was the Comfort Inn across from the Hillsboro Airport. Next slide. So uh, our count this year, um, we had 52 uh, total enumerators. Those enumerators, included uh, service providers uh, from the organizations that I just talked about, municipal staff from each of the uh, cities in Washington County, as well as police department personnel. Uh, we decided, uh, made a decision not to use volunteers this year. Uh, earlier in the council meeting, uh, people were bringing up the hands-on Portland, Greater Portland volunteers. We have used them in the past. But due to the pandemic, we decided that for safety reasons, it was best not to use volunteers and be encumbered by having to test uh, all volunteers, train them, uh, and that sort of thing. So um, in the city of Hillsboro, uh, we had the benefit also of not only the police department personnel, but all the code enforcement people also participated as enumerators on January 27th. Um, we had a canned remote training that everybody uh, virtually attended instead of the in-person trainings. Um, it was COVID specific. We conducted socially distanced interviews. And um, for the cities of Beaverton, Tigard, Forest Grove, Cornelius, Hillsboro, and Aloha, we covered all of those areas at the same point in time on January 27th, uh, 2021. We had lead personnel from each of the municipalities um, uh, coordinate counts in, in, in all of those individual areas. And then during the dates of January 28th through the 31st, we uh, conducted counts in any gaps that were identified during our counting process and in some of the unincorporated areas of the county, such as Aloha and some of the pockets that are in between Hillsboro and Aloha. Um, and outlining areas such as uh, North Plains, et cetera. Um, this year, late in the game, we moved away from using a paper form and we made the decision to purchase some software from SimTech um, Technologies um, in the form of a mobile counting application that people were able to load onto their phones. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. Next slide. So uh, somewhere around the 28th of December, we made the decision to uh, use the mobile county app. Um, between January 4th and 10th, we uh, set up the app in, in our systems and uh, customized it to fit the Washington County geographic area. Uh, we identified geographic areas and grouped them within the app. Uh, we went through a testing phase of this um, point time count app between the dates of January 11th and the 22nd, um, at which time there was a two day no activity period where we created this firewall between the testing period where all of the enumerators were playing around inside the app and getting acquainted with how to use it. And then on the 25th of January, we activated the app live 
And from that point forward, anything that was entered into the app uh, was part of what became the point in time count of 2021. Um, next. So uh, the use of the app and, and ex experience, uh, we will definitely be using an app in all future counts. And we hope to also include it in street outreach efforts a, on a year round basis, a different form of the app from the same company. But it enabled uh, constant monitoring of pit, uh, point in time count activities through a command uh, center feature. So I was able to enter into the command center during the point in time count in Hillsboro and actually watch the entire count unfold from the Civic Center uh, in real time uh, across the entire county and watch the numbers increase. Uh, it had a GPS feature that enabled us to drill down into each interview that took place uh, all the way to the person's name that was being interviewed and the street corner in the county that they were being interviewed at. Uh, it was actually turned out to be a less intrusive experience for the homeless persons that we were interviewing. Um, and uh, like I said before, it'll, it'll be used in the future. So with that, um, we have uh, the results that were gleaned from the 2021 point in time count. Ceci, Cecilia Bonvino will be covering a little bit of the outcomes uh, for you now. Thank Next you, Brad. Yes. Um, good evening, uh, Mayor and Council. I am Cecilia Bombino. I'm the Senior Manager Systems Analyst for Community Action Washington County. Uh, and I will be uh, walking you through the results of the last point in time count. Um, next slide, please. So before we go into the results, I, I wanted to mention that uh, the, the totals you'll see are specifically for the unsheltered count. Uh, and uh, while we were conducting the count, uh, I do want to say there were also 390 people approximately that were counted in shelter during the same week. Next slide, please. So um, the total for this point in time count, uh, we, we counted 357 uh, people total. Um, 42 uh, were considered chronically homeless, uh, 15 reporting being veterans, 20 uh, reporting being domestic violence victims, and 263 uh, people reporting having a, a disability. Um, the breakdown by region, uh, as it was defined for the count, uh, is as you can see on the right, uh, we counted 213 people in Hillsboro, 64 in Beaverton, 34 in the area of Forest Grove, Gaston and Banks, uh, 20 in Tiger, 17 in Cornelius, 7 in Aloha, and two people in Tualatin, in Sherwood area. Next slide, please. Uh, for this year, the breakdown by race and ethnicity is as you see it uh, here, and it, it is consistent with um, the breakdown we have seen in past point in time counts, which we'll see uh, in future slides. Next slide, please. Uh, to talk a little bit of, about comparisons uh, with past point in time counts, uh, we have seen an increase in the number of people counted uh, since the point in time count in 2019. Um, next slide, please. Uh, to look at some other uh, factors and, and how they compare uh, between the different point in time counts. Uh, there has been a slight decrease in people uh, considered chronically homeless. Uh, we have also seen a decrease in people reporting being uh, victims of domestic violence. Uh, the, the number of veterans uh, has stayed steady between last year and this year. 
uh, and the number of people reporting disabilities has increased uh, in the past um, to two point time counts. Next slide, please. When we compare the past point in time counts uh, and the breakdown in race and ethnicity, uh, the breakdown in groups is, is similar. We have seen an increase in people reporting as white. Um, and there has been a, a bit of a decrease in people reporting as non-Hispanic and, and a slight increase in people reporting as Hispanic uh, Latinos. Next slide, please. When we look at the breakdown by region as they were um, defined for the different point in time counts, um, there we have seen an increase in the people counted in the Hillsborough Aloha uh, area. Um, and a slight increase is also in the first Grove Cornelius and Banks area as it compares to past point in time counts um, and a bit of a decrease in the uh, Tiger Toilet in Sherwood area. Next slide, please. Uh, as, as Pat was mentioning, we did use a, an app uh, this time, which allowed us to, uh, to view the count as, as it was happening in an interactive map. So um, we have, um, if you can go to the next slide, please. This is a, a, a screenshot of the, the app and, and how we were able to view uh, the interviews and the precise location of where they were happening. Uh, next slide. And this is a little bit of a magnified uh, view of the same map, but um, you can really uh, zoom in all the way to the precise uh, location in which each interview uh, took place. Next slide. I will turn it over to Pat now for, for these next two slides. Thank you. So each year at the same point in time, Annette Evans is in charge of conducting what is called the housing inventory chart. And basically that's an inventory of all of the beds that have been designated for homeless persons to occupy, whether it be in shelter, whether it be in a uh, short, to medium term rent assistance program uh, as a method of transitioning from homelessness into permanent housing situations or sustainable housing situations. So um, the housing inventory of, of beds that were available in both shelter and temporary housing programs as a bridge from homelessness to permanent housing, uh, the inventory was 1,248 uh, beds in shelter and housing as compared to 1,001 in 2020. Um, there were 1,034 year-round beds in shelter and housing programs. And so those were all occupied by persons who originally presented as being homeless. There were also 214 seasonal uh, overflow beds in the winter shelter system a 104 bed increase from uh, the previous year. Uh, this winter shelter system this year was not triggered by severe weather events. It was permanently open from the month of November throughout uh, part of the system is still open today. Um, there was a decrease in year round shelter and uh, the shelter piece I think Annette included in this slide uh, uh, by mistake, but there was a decrease in year round transitional housing bed utilization due to COVID-19 social distancing and safety practices. But um, the graph that follows this shows the actual increase in bed utilization in shelter. Uh, there is a net decrease in utilization uh, by 62 beds in rapid rehousing programs and a net increase in beds in permanent supportive housing programs. So uh, what that means really is there were more permanent supportive housing opportunities made available to the homeless population 
And then the decrease in uh, rapid rehousing um, utilization was primarily due to the point in time that Annette conducted this inventory, uh, but that fluctuates throughout the, the year. And at that particular point in time, there's been some heavy recruitment for permanent housing choice vouchers through the mainstream voucher program and the Kaiser Metro 300 program. These are permanent subsidies for homeless persons um, and rather than temporary subsidies. So that kind of uh, released some of the pressure on the rapid rehousing program. Next slide. And then uh, finally, this is a graph that shows basically the same um, stuff uh, or same information that I was describing in the previous slide. The top bar represents the total housing inventory increase throughout the years beginning in 2009 through uh, 2021. Um, the second uh, bar represents permanent supportive housing increases over time from 2009 to 2021. Um, we have a flat line of year round emergency shelter that, like I said earlier, did increase a little bit through the addition of a couple of family promise programs that started operating in the county in Beaverton and Tualatin. Um, so that added a little bit of capacity to year round shelter, but that has typically stayed flat throughout the years because of the, the the amount of beds that were available that hadn't changed in, in that length of time. Um, the safe haven down below is no longer operational. So that gave us a zero for last year, but when it was in operation, it steadily had full beds uh, throughout its period of time in operation. So with that, um, that's uh, the conclusion of our presentation. Um, one thing I'll say about this graph, uh, this increase in bed utilization represents uh, 1,034 people that would otherwise have been homeless had these programs not been in place. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Do, Council, do you have any questions for, for Pat or Cecilia? Um, this is Councilor Van Bevern. I, I, the first thing that struck me was a disproportionate number of the homeless in our county are uh, reside in Hillsborough. And uh, I wonder if I wonder what factors are in play there to explain that. Well, um, I can only anecdotally answer that question or guess, uh, but uh, the visibility of homelessness is, is uh, something that is supported in feedback we're hearing from all the municipal police officers. Um, the Beaverton police are not seeing homeless encampments at, and uh, visible homeless camping taking place in Beaverton at the same level that we're seeing in and around Hillsboro for whatever reason. Uh, I've been doing this for about 20 years. I, we've always seen a few more folks in Hillsboro than anywhere else in the county. And uh, the only thing I can attribute that to would be that the county seat is in Hillsboro. And I think a lot of the uh, processes that some of the homeless population are in, involved or engaged in, like the judicial system, et cetera, uh, could be some of the reason why um, we see more homeless persons in the hills, in and around the Hillsboro area. Thank you. This is uh, Councillor Allen. Um, one of the things that stood out for me was the, it looked like almost two thirds of those that were homeless um, had disabilities. And, um, you know, one of the organizations that, that I think that, that we all need to um, build upon is ASSIST, which helps folks with disabilities get access to their social security disability income. Um, because it is a bureaucratic system and it's something that is not easily navigated, but um, they're very uh, good at getting folks uh, in the assist program, those resources, and through those resources, often that can provide other opportunities for folks. Um, and so I just, that, that number seemed high. Is that, is that number of, of 
homeless folks that we've identified with disabilities similar to years past? Well, uh, like the graph indicated, it is gradually increased. The, the report of disability has gradually increased uh, with each point in time count over the years. There could be a lot of reasons for that. Either there are just more people that are homeless due to their disabilities being a factor in their homelessness, or uh, people are more willing to report that uh, during an interview than they were in the past for whatever reason. Uh, those could be two things that influence that. Um, yeah. Is addiction included in that disability number? Uh, we track addiction separately, uh, but it is, I believe, part of the module that, that deals with disability. And I will say that uh, to tag on to um, Mr. Allen's comments about the assist program, they regularly participate in our street outreach uh, meetings and also in other case conferencing efforts uh, around chronically homeless uh, folks that were trying to problem solve their housing issues. Um, I think uh, one of the hugest factors people with disabilities face is even if they have social security income, it's fixed and it's a poverty wage uh, and um, housing costs are extremely high as we all know. Um, and once a person becomes homeless, the lack of stability and that uh, survival mode kicks in and it becomes extremely difficult to stay engaged in processes and that sort of thing when you're just trying to make sure you're safe for the following night. Councilor Alcare and then Councilor Pace. Thanks, Mayor. Um, I have um, a few questions. Um, one, it was mentioned that Aloha, there's uh, more homeless in Aloha. Is that along TV Highway? I'm just I, curious. I, I don't recall that there was more homeless in, in Aloha. Maybe Ceci okay. can speak to that. I thought I saw a number. It was a combined uh, uh, section, Aloha and Hillsboro, when we were doing the comparisons uh, with past point in time count. Okay. Yeah, if we were. It, it was making because in, of that uh, combination. Sorry. If we were I, to burn, it, zoom further in on the command center, it would uh, separate the a low number from the Hillsboro number of more cleanly. Thank you. Um, we're, we're hearing a lot more complaints about camps on TV highway. That's why uh, that made me think about that. Um, then my next question is, it looked like on your graph that um, that transitional housing didn't, and I don't know if I was reading your graph right. If transitional housing doesn't work, is it effective? Transitional housing and, does work. Okay. As long as there's a uh, exit strategy and uh, there's capacity in the system to provide for a clean exit from the transitional setting. Uh, okay. Otherwise people get stuck in that setting. Thank you. And then my last um, question is because of the, the the nature of uh, things coming together so that somebody gets housed is dependent on so many factors and different people that um, it's often possible that th there could be a deadline for somebody to get into housing that's like 48 hours away, only something happens and they get a parking ticket or they get something happens where they've done something because of where they are and they miss out on the opportunity to get the housing because they couldn't fulfill things they had to get done in the 48 hours. I, I don't know if I'm describing this right to you, but I'm just trying to think like how many people get stuck in that position where there's like hours away from getting um, a successful story, right? Of transitional housing. How often does it happen where um, that fails? because it happens i'm sorry no go ahead 
we have a little bit of a delay. Um, yeah, it happens quite often. And uh, whether or not a person has a place in to a uh, place to be stable each night is kind of a, a factor in that. If there's a lack of stability, or if a person is out camping uh, in an unorganized camping situation, um, their day-to-day -day schedule is very disorganized and that influences um, that. So if, if we can keep people in a, in a safe spot while they transition and work on transition plans, uh, that's the key really right there. Well, thank you. Um, how mindful can city council be when we decide to pass ordinances or discuss uh, changes in laws or enact things? Um, does that also affect people from that tricky situation of getting their housing fixed. Yes, it, it does ha have an impact, uh, a consequence of some sort, whether it's positive or negative. Thank you very much. Um, hey, th uh, thanks for the briefing. Pat and Cecilia, I really appreciate it. This is Councillor Pace. I have a couple of questions for you. Um, I also want to say thanks for having addiction um, tracked as well. So thank you. I was wondering if you tracked LGBTQIA plus folks. Um, the, the standard number is 40% nationally of homeless folks are LGBTQ because they get kicked out a lot <laughs> of where they're living. So I was wondering, did by any chance, was that part of your count? It certainly is. And I can let Cecilia speak to that uh, from a data perspective. Thank you. Uh, yes, we have included that information in past counts, uh, but we have not, we were not able to do it this time around. Okay. Um, if possible, the next count, if you could include that, that'd be great. Uh, yeah. I Absolutely, and the reason is that we were deploying this app for the first time and uh, there was not really time to work on, on custom questions uh, and that was one of them, unfortunately was left out. Yeah, uh, th thanks for even entertaining it. Um, I think it's just important to know when we're talking about services and different services. Um, and then Pat, you mentioned that you thought maybe the, the reason for the I thought the increase was really large from like 100 to 220 as far as the number of homeless in Hillsborough, Aloha. You thought it was where the county seat. Do you think there's any other reason for that? Because that's an incredible increase. Um, well, when, when I said that was an anecdotal answer sure. and that's based on what I've witnessed over a 20 year period. I see. Um, Just so, access to so Yes, yeah, but the dramatic increase over the past um, year or two years is can only be explained by um, the dramatic increase that's also seen in, in the Portland area, in Multnomah County, um, everywhere else. Um, the cost of housing is just kind of what is feeding the homeless crisis, homelessness mm -hmm. crisis, and um, temporary subsidies. Um, used to work because there was this ideal type of homeless person that you would serve and they would go to work eventually after they were stabilized and such. And a lot of the folks we're seeing uh, camping along TV highway and uh, mm -hmm. that were at the McKay Creek camp uh, are folks that uh, uh, full-time employment probably is not in their future. Mm -hmm. And so they'll, they'll be on fixed incomes uh, if, if that is achievable for, for them. And um, they'll be limited in their housing choices uh, due to that fixed income. So uh, we're hopeful that the uh, supportive houses, housing services dollars that are coming in to the county uh, will help uh, resolve a lot of that. Uh, but uh, that starts on July 1st and It'll take some time for all of that to, that effort to roll out, but we're 
we're hoping that that is the thing that will sort of resolve a lot of what we're seeing out there. Okay. And my last question is, do you know, uh, did you by any chance track if any of them had access to COVID shots or were even interested in that? Uh, I think that'd be very difficult for that uh, cohort to get to shots, but I was just wondering if, if you tracked any of that interest, access, et cetera. We did not track interest. Okay. Uh, we just uh, gave information on how to access right. and uh, there, there was just like the rest of the population, there was a number that uh, wanted to access that and others who refused. Yeah, I, I was talking to some homeless folks at a, at, a, at a vaccination station and they had been trying for a while to get shots and they felt that that was, you know, ease of access was huge for them, that they were just able to walk over from their cars to get the shots, but, um, and they were ready and willing, but had been searching for a very long time. One of the reasons they couldn't get it was because while they lived in their car, their car could did not run. And so they couldn't go through drive through clinics. Such a simple thing, right. barrier that many of us wouldn't even think about, but um, they were ready and willing, just couldn't find it. Side note, thank you again for the briefing. Hey, this is uh, Councillor Allen. Just uh, one thing that, that I remember from about three years ago um, when we were discussing the point time count, we, it, was, uh, it was fluctuating uh, up and down. And every time we would hear a presentation, we'd say, uh, we know that this is not accurate. And I remember about three years ago, the decision was made to start uh, doing a, a much better effort of tracking where these camps were located and using our paid staff to make sure that when the point in time count came, that we were able to identify them as opposed to relying so heavily on volunteers. So I don't know if that uh, plays a little bit into um, us being able to get a really strong point in time count on that specific date. But I just remember a couple of years, like three years ago, it was, uh, it was a big discussion. Well, uh, each point in time count is limited by the capacity you have in, in a given point of time to reach as many people as possible. So there's inaccuracy inherent in that, um, just having to do something at a point in time. But one of the things I was discussing earlier was the street year round daily street outreach efforts that are taking place right now. We're kind of informing a lot of that there are also uh, discussions at the county level around uh, encampments, uh, where organized encampments are starting to pop up, um, whether they're on county property or whether they're on private property uh, dictates what kind of response can be made. But I think at the county level, um, the county is taking the position that um, if a, an encampment pops up during this period of time, in, on county land that they're going to ensure that at the very least their sanitation uh, at that location uh, and that um, there are a regular trash pickup and that sort of thing. So an example of that is on 197th and baseline where the county put some porta potties in, erected a screen to block the porta potties from the from baseline road. And then also they have hand washing stations and regular um, disposal, trash disposal pickup. And so the homeless persons that are staying there are appreciative of that uh, given the lack of, of anything else at the time. And uh, they're also utilizing the, the trash bins that, are, that, that have been made available to them. So that's kind of like a, a kind of a test example of, of what's better than just leaving an encampment um, evolve like the McKay Creek thing did, which was on private property. I know it's not my turn to talk yet, but I wanted to chime in on Councillor Pace's um, questions. Hi, Kim Marshall with Project Homeless Connect. Um, so a couple things. First one is easy in terms of COVID shots. We've been able to work with the county to bring um, partners in to give shots to folks that are in our sheltering system still. So that's really helpful and also to our day center. Um, and then we're working with our outreach teams to figure out how to continue to connect folks that choose to get the shot. 
um, do those, those drive through services or, or things like that. Right. Um, and then your other question about the increase of number in Hillsborough. So um, <clears throat> it's gonna be a two-parter. Um, part of it is you guys need to pat yourselves on the back because you guys were champions. You championed our day center which, which means we had more people in downtown Hillsboro. You championed the Civic Center opening up for those severe weather six weeks. Um, and, and then McKay Creek, where we um, successfully, unsuccessfully um, did our best to have people shelter in place where they were camping um, because of COVID. This allowed us to build a relationship with folks over that timeline and uh, then know where they were and be able to pinpoint use it using this great technology that Cecilia has helped put in place in this county. So I think that it's not necessarily a, you know, if you build it, they will come situation. It's you have to remember so many of our partner agencies closed down. They yeah, had to yeah. shut down. They needed to do what was safe for their staff and make those decisions. And, and we fully understand that. We did it. We made a decision in March of 2020 at Project Homeless Connect to stay open and continue working and make sure that people had a safe place to go. So we were able to engage them at the day center, do the civic center, our other shelters um, here in Hillsboro, plus in the um, engagement with the folks at McKay um, and some of that. So I, I don't think it's surprising that we saw that increase in Hillsboro this year. Um, it, it, it's because we responded to COVID in some ways and you guys championed some things to make sure that that our friends were safe. Right. Kim, I appreciate you saying that because I've heard to the, if you build it, they will come. I've heard that a lot, right? If you build it, they will come and, and people tell me no. Um, other people say, absolutely. The more services that we offer, the more people will show up. And you could look at that two ways. You could say, well, they need the help. Let's, let's help them, right? Um, they're, they're humans, they're our neighbors, right? We should help them. Um, Absolutely, but yeah. I think we learned, um, particularly with this past uh, severe weather shelter season, oh. where COVID required us to have um, consecutive days of shelter in regions throughout the county. And we learned from our wait list that folks were very clear, this is my home base. I want to be in Tigard. This is my community, so that's the shelter I want to be in. I don't mm -hmm. care if there's not an opening you know, here, I don't want to go to Hillsboro because that's not my home base or the vice versa. Hillsboro is where, where I am. This is my home base. This is, I consider this my community. These are where my friends are and I access services this way. And this is where I want to be. And it only emphasized for me that that saying truly isn't, it doesn't work. Um, if you build it, they will come. Our, our friends aren't as transient as we sometimes, you know, make them out to be. Um, right. They have communities as well, and they want to stay in those communities. Sometimes it's out of necessity to move to a different community for services, depending on what's happening. Uh, but for the most part, they'll stick to their particular regions. Mm, I appreciate that, that insight. Thank you. And also kudos to you as a social impact leader, nonprofit leader for staying open. Um, I know it wasn't easy. So congratulations on doing that and for continuing your service. I appreciate that. We, we were protected and none of my staff. And, and honestly, you guys, if we want to talk about it, very few of our homeless friends had COVID as well. Um, mm -hmm. And we just know, as many of you know, um, we want to serve people well and make sure that um, this marginalized community is seen and known. And so we'll, we'll do whatever it, it takes. Right on. Thank you. Councilor Alcare. Hi, Kim. Um, I want to ask you a question. And um, uh, what can we do as a council outside the box? What could we do that we're not thinking of that could make a difference? Um, you're, you're stealing my show <laughs> or I'm stealing Simone's. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, you know, you guys are, are, are doing it in a lot of ways. I mean, one of the things that's so fantastic about the city of Hillsborough is that you do champion things and you guys are having these conversations and you're taking the hard stuff from your community at large and listening to the voices and asking that question. Um, it, it's so important that at least we're, we're talking about it. And so I know um, in Simone's next slide, she's going to highlight some things that need to happen. 
and I think that she's right on with, with some key things that the city needs to be looking at short term and long term. And one of those is going to be Wood Street that we're going to talk about. I have a question about the data collection. So we talked about the built for zero and the attempt to start to track encampments and houses folks throughout the year in order to better identify who they are, where they are, and how we can help them. Um, so how are we intending to how are we intending to be able to track and count folks throughout the year? Is that something where potentially not a number being important, but are we are we keeping track of these people and trying to understand how we can better help them throughout the year? Is that is because the, the bill for zero, as you were talking about it, it, it seemed like the preparation was for this day. And I understand that. But I what I also took away from it is that it's not just a preparation for this day. It's trying to use that data source and build on it and have it be an everyday data source rather than a once a year thing. Is, is that correct? That is correct. <laughs> so that is correct. And what was so great about Ceci doing all the legwork to get this technical assistance for us is that we're going to get to use it throughout the year. And so we have outreach okay. teams throughout the county, um, Project Homes Connect, Community Action, Just Compassion, New Narrative, have outreach teams throughout the county, Home Plate, um, that are engaging with folks every single day. And so although HUD requires us to do this point in time count the last 10 days of January, um, as you just said, it's not about the numbers. This is about the, the people. This is about our homeless friends. This is about relationship building and understand their barriers to the root causes of why they are where they are. And we can go into all the details of that. Uh, and so it's, it's so cool. I mean, really it's exciting that we now are going to have this technology piece that we get to use um, to help keep track, quote unquote, um, of our friends, understanding where they are, where encampments are growing and movement of folks um, all while building a relationship and, and working towards self-sufficiency. Okay. I'm trying to leave it open. For, I'm letting you control the show, Mayor. Oh, bless your heart. Thank you. So. Um, He's way past his bedtime. <laughs> you know, so um, I guess I want to make sure that council has the opportunity to ask questions before we turn it back over then to, you know, Simone and presenters for, uh, you know, for additional uh, comments. I guess one one question that I might ask, you know, rec, uh, recognizing the location where the county is uh, citing, well, you know, the Econo Lodge, and you know, one of the one of the reasons that I've read is that it's being placed, you know, in um, one of our areas, one of our communities of color, is because um, the disproportionate impact of the pandemic on people of color. So are we seeing then that that is actually who is being housed there? Um, because I remember the demographics, the graph and was overwhelmingly white. And so um, if we're seeing that same proportionality, you know, that it would almost lead me to believe that that is the wrong site, um, you know, or the wrong location, um, you know, for, you know, for the program that the county is 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 running, um, but I also want to be careful that I'm not, you know, reaching a a, a poor conclusion based on either um, misinterpreting data or incomplete data. So I don't know that, I, and I recognize it's kind of a loaded question, so I don't know who to address that to. Mayor, can I add something here? Sure. Um, so we're talking about businesses on 10th Avenue, Latinx businesses, and um, who are in that area. And, and now all of a sudden, now here's the Econolodge. So those are th that's who is affected in this situation. And um, 
I haven't understood that those businesses don't want to be supportive of trying to help homeless. It's just sort of a situation that got thrown into their neighborhood and is affecting their business. And so it's a situation where um, we didn't have the conversation about how do you feel about this project coming into your neighborhood that's actually going to be taking place tomorrow with the county. But I, I just wanted to add that. Thank you. Mayor, what I can say, because we're doing our best to really make sure that we fully understand um, all the pieces is you're correct. Our demographics do not support um, some of that. What I know, and after reading the LIP um, and, and trying to get a better understanding is, I don't know, and I'm gonna just use Project Homes Connect. I don't know if we've done a great job making sure that our culturally specific populations know they're welcome. Even though we know that they're welcome. I don't know if we've done a great job to, to know that they're welcome. Um, to, you know, and shelter is difficult because shelter is really first come first serve. And if we don't have the demographics showing up then how, to, what does that look like? But again, are we making sure that all of our brochures are, are multi, you know, language? Um, do we have staff that, that, that look and feel like all the demographics of the folks that were serving and our staff does. We have LGBTQ, we have you know people of color, we have indigenous, we have immigrants, um, we have folks that are bilingual. So PHC actually embodies all the things because um, homelessness doesn't discriminate. And so we're, we're trying to figure out, okay, how do we make sure that we are doing our due diligence and intentionally reaching out to these other communities um, who might've felt even more marginalized um, and let them know they're welcome. You're welcome at our day center. You're welcome at our shelters. You know, we want to engage with you with, in outreach and whatever other services we can provide. And so although the demographics don't match up kind of some of the strategies that are happening, I think there's just some work to do on the partner agency side here in Washington County around some of this, making sure that we're partnering with BNSR and um, Central Cultural and some, uh, you know, some of those things um, to make sure that we are all inclusive intentionally, not just saying, we're, we're, oh yeah, everyone's welcome, but really intentionally making sure that folks understand that they're welcome. I, I, um, I just I, wanna I, add oh. something and that um, I would not assume that the Latinx businesses are so connected with Vienna Star and Centro that that is where they're getting their leadership and direction on how to deal with homeless people affecting their business. They are literally working with the police they're calling the police. And, um, and so I, I just want to be careful about um, not making the assumption that where they're getting help. They are getting help from the chamber. And yeah, with I Nancy mean, Lopez. I, really, I, I truly, I can't speak to the Econo Lodge site placement, you know, the choice of that. Um, I can just speak to the other side of it around um, our intentions of trying to be completely culturally specific and inclusive of, of everyone in the work that we're doing, because again, homelessness doesn't discriminate. Um, I will be on that call tomorrow night, Olivia, um, uh, because I think that that community has a voice and they should be heard. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's, it's so difficult. It's so difficult to, to to do the good work and to get everyone's voice and make all the right decisions. You guys are in a very difficult position um, in, in, in all the things. So. Uh, an another thing I would add, Mayor, is that at a minimum, just looking at it at a high level, you know, Washington County as a whole is about 80% white, about two and a half percent of folks in Washington County are black and based on the point in time count, 5% of folks who are homeless are black. So, so it's one of those where there are disproportionate racial impacts in, in our point in time count. I, I know that the white, there was ethnicity and then there was also other, so I'd be curious to dig down. I'm not sure it's safe to say that that showed it was a predominantly white uh, homelessness problem in Washington County, whereas the county was saying it was, um, it impacts people of color. I think that the, the, the count of, of black folks who were homeless, I think was a, indicative of that, of 
two and a half percent of the population, yet five percent of the population. Um, if I want, if I may add something to this discussion, um, the the number of of white uh, versus the ethnicity plays a big role. Uh, a lot of uh, Hispanics, Latinos uh, also check the white box uh, a lot of the times. Uh, and uh, this, a few things, this is uh, not only self-reported, but also is following the, the breakdown of race as, as is, is, has been set up by the federal government. Uh, that is not including multiracial. So uh, the, the, the options are already limited. Uh, that that means people sometimes will report uh, uh, and the interviewer will have to fit that person within one of the boxes available in in the form if, if so so that uh, is uh, that means we are seeing a partial view of the the real picture Cecilia, this is Olivia. So are the two options that somebody could check that they are white, non-Hispanic, or that they are white and that they are Hispanic? They can check both or they can check one or the other. But that's not really true representation of who Latinx is. Uh, They're not white. I'm not exactly. white. Right, that's, I guess that's my point. There is no other alternative for somebody uh, in the Latino community to say um, the race that they are part of. Thank you. All right, anybody else? And Kim, thank you for weighing in on that question. Um, I appreciate, you know, by answering it, you kind of ended up having to own all of the, the issues that were part of that. So thank you. Um, I appreciate the, I appreciate your willingness to, to engage with that question. Okay. okay. You ready so, for so, me, Mayor? I think so. Um, Pat, Cecilia, thank you so much for, for I think, um, Pat, you were planning on staying on. You've got, you both are certainly welcome to, but I appreciate you making the time to come and present. This is such, um, it, it is always interesting information and it, and it is always alarming information. Um, it's just, it is not a good state of affairs, um, but that's why we're in the conversations we're, we're having right now and, and why we're fortunate to see some funding coming down. Um, so I'm going to actually share my screen this time. Let me see how that works. You can do it, Simone. Yeah, yeah, it all, it's all fun and games. <laughs> I am guessing you guys do not have the right screen right now. Are you guys seeing the screen along the, the screens along the side as well? Yes, we're seeing we that side. All right. I'm sure I'm Here we go. Now you have a full screen. We yes, do. thank you. Okay, so these should hopefully look familiar to you. These are uh, three of the city council priorities that you established in February. Um, three of, of many, um, but these are the three that were related to, are related to homelessness. And I've highlighted the two that um, led to our current project. So just two days after the council retreat, uh, city staff connected with two of our community partners, um, one of whom is on this call, uh, Kim Marshall, and um, also Catherine Gallion from uh, Community Action met with us to identify possible short-term and long-term interventions and initiatives to address homelessness here in Hillsboro. Um, so some of the interventions that um, we identified together um, as, as something that we wanted to pursue and continue conversations about were a day center, a year round shelter, uh, a year round shelter that would be co-located with a day center, 
um, overnight camping site and a 24 seven camping site. For a shelter, day center or co-located facilities, we estimated that site identification, community engagement, property purchase, facility renovations, coordination with the county and community partners for supportive housing services operating funds and facility management could require a year or more easily. Um, so this, while this work continues, it is very much in its earliest stages and we're looking forward again to bringing on board the community services coordinator to kind of shepherd those efforts. Um, in contrast, the development of a, a sanctioned overnight camping site or a, um, either 24 seven or overnight could be accomplished in a more, much more reasonable um, time frame, uh, particularly as staff had already identified, identified city owned properties for consideration. Um, availability of city sanctioned campsite paired with an ordinance to regulate time, place and manner also would equip our police officers with a more reliable law enforcement tool. I know you um, have heard um, I've either I believe in public comment or earlier on about just some of the limitations about what some of our officers can do. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And then I think Ch both Chad and Andy are on the call if any questions come up um, as I um, move my way through this. Um, a, a sanctioned overnight, um, I mean, lost my mind here. So currently, getting, I, try, I wanna make sure that I don't mess up the Martin v. Boise decision. So hold on, Chad, hold on tight. Um, currently our police and economic development departments receive complaints about unhoused community members laying down or sleeping or sitting on sidewalks um, in front of businesses and doorways and homes and establishing camps in neighborhood parks. I know you hear about that in other public pro property. Um, this is oftentimes due to a lack of alternative options. Um, so the co-occurring implications of uh, COVID-19 pandemic, limited affordable housing, a lack of supporting houses, supportive housing services and the Martin v. Boise decision have limited the tools um, that are available to our officers to address these types of community concerns um, that then become chronic. Um, so does it, are people familiar with the, the Martin v. Boise case? I can only see some of you at this point. So if you are not and you have questions, you'll have to be oral. Could you at least describe it in like high level term? Chad, can I get you to jump in? I don't wanna get it wrong. Sure, absolutely. Uh, again, Mayor, members of the Council, Chad Jacobs from the City Attorney's Office. In, in short, in a very high level term, what the Martin v. Boise decision uh, decided, it was a Ninth Circuit case, and it basically decided that it, you cannot criminalize the act of being homeless um, by prohibiting people from engaging in the basic human function of sitting and lying down um, when you don't have another place as, such as a shelter bed for them to go to to do that. So if you don't provide a space for individuals who are experiencing homelessness to sleep at night through a shelter bed or otherwise, then you can't have a prohibition within the city that says you can't sleep overnight anywhere within the city. Um, and you know, that's the very high level. There's lots of nuances to it. Uh, as Andy can explain as well, there's a, a House bill going through right now, House Bill 3115, which will also require cities to update their codes to create reasonable regulations um, to basically come into compliance with the Boise decision. So these are all things that the city is currently working on and ordinances will be coming to the council in the near future to address those issues as we get more clarity um, as House Bill 3115 moves through the legislative process. I don't know if you need more than that. I'm happy to answer specific questions, but that's sort of a high level overview. Chad, this is Olivia. Mm -hmm. um, so based on that law, um, can we move people? Can we, can we ask them to move uh, or can we, do we let them stay? I, I, I wanna know because I think our, uh, our police have been in a position where they've had to um, ask people to move from where they are. So, so two answers to that question, Councilor Arcare. Um, the first is when you're dealing with private property, um, 
and the, the property owner asks us to remove someone from their property, we can absolutely do that. Um, you know, this case doesn't deal with private property, it's really dealing with public property. The second answer is, yeah, we can move people from specific areas of public property as well, but we can't enforce a prohibition of basically no camping in the city at all. So part of what the legislation or the ordinance that you know the city is working on right now is trying to determine locations within the city where overnight sleeping would be permitted if shelter beds were not available. Um, and so that's part of the process that you have to go through, but it doesn't mean that you have to allow it anywhere in the city on any public property. So for example, if we wanted to maintain the limitation on sleeping in parks overnight, we could do that as long as we provided some other area of the city on public property where individuals who are experiencing homelessness could sleep. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, I'm, I'm hoping you're not waving at me frantically. So thank you, Chad. <laughs> So uh, in terms, of, so there were two types of camps that we've had on the list. So the overnight camping site and a 24 seven camping site. Um, in terms of the two types of camps an overnight camp lacks stability. So essentially, will will I have a place to say, stay and keep my belongings? Um, it limits the ability of community partners to consistently connect and to build trust. Um, so the people at the camp may vary and when they come, they'll, they may be sleeping if it's overnight rather than actually engaging with services. Um, and it can also create more foot traffic in and around the, the area um, neighboring the camp. So al although the Wood Street site is, is a temporary site, it is the, the intention is to, for, for it to be 24 seven. Um, and it is the preferred option because it, is, it allows it to be a safe, stable place to sit lie down, sleep, store belongings, and probably most importantly, um, have access to those basic, both the basic services and social services. Um, so to, we're at that point now where we're actually talking specifically about the site itself. So for that, um, in terms of site location and design, I am going to uh, turn it over to Justin DeMello. And Justin, I'll get your slide up here in just a second. Thank you, Simone, and, and good evening, Mayor and City Councilors. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to share a little additional specific information about the Wood Street Camp uh, site and some of the elements that have gone into uh, shaping its, its design. So the, the area that we're looking at is an undeveloped grass field located between two city-owned facilities, and that's the uh, materials and equipment storage yard used by the water department to the west and uh, the fire and police training facility located immediately to the east. So our neighbor to the south is Jackson Bottom, property owned uh, and maintained by Clean Water Services. And uh, we've been in, in communication with them regarding the project. Uh, the field is bounded to the north by Wood Street itself. And uh, the field sits back a little bit from the road with a with a row of uh, pretty, pretty dense and tall blackberries to, that provide some, uh, some visual screening from Wood Street. Our nearest neighbor to the north is uh, Knife River Concrete. And uh, our, our second nearest neighbor down at the end of Wood Street uh, to the west is uh, Lakeside uh, Asphalt. Um, there is a residential community of about 20 properties located to uh, the east down Wood Street as you approach the highway. Um, the nearest home there is about two tenths of a mile from, from where the camp is, is proposed. And in respects to transportation and traffic, uh, Wood Street is a relatively lightly traveled roadway uh, overall. However, it, it has a pretty high volume of, of heavy traffic, heavy truck traffic coming to and from Knife River and Lakeside. And uh, down uh, where the homes are at the east end, there are no uh, sidewalks or pedestrian infrastructure. So that's one of the, the challenges of the site uh, would be related to transportation. Uh, looking at the camp design, uh, we incorporated uh, feedback uh, from, uh, from Kim with PHC, uh, as well as some of our internal stakeholders in the police department, the fire department, and, uh, and with risk management. 
and to develop a layout that really meets the needs of all those stakeholders. And I think that we are really there in terms of having a design that, that, that meets the needs of all of those uh, groups. And this has been highlighted, uh, everything about the camp is designed to be temporary. Uh, so it's a lot of vendor support for providing things like portable toilets, hand washing station, uh, garbage service, uh, things like that. It's all designed to be temporary and we're hoping to uh, be able to set up the camp with, with nothing more than a temporary use permit. A couple of the main features uh, involve a water connection and a designated smoking uh, area, uh, a perimeter fence, and uh, we're looking at constructing 30 uh, actual tent platforms or, or pads uh, in order to get the campers up off the ground, of course, especially during rainy times, but also to help delineate uh, that this is an approved place to put a camp and to help uh, with the management of limiting it to the 30 campers that are intended uh, by making it clear that, that tents are, are only allowed on the designated uh, tent pads. And uh, one other piece of information I just would like to pass along, I know we heard earlier uh, from Laura uh, Pullman and Kelly Emmons in the uh, uh, public comment uh, period. But I just wanted to convey that uh, we, we did reach out to the community, uh, everything uh, south of the train tracks and west of the highway. And I think Kim's gonna, or uh, rather Simone's gonna touch on that in just a minute, I believe, uh, what the communications outreach has been. But uh, we did reach out to the immediate vicinity, both businesses and, and residents. And I do want to convey their feedback as it's been, um, you know, uh, coming in here all this week. And uh, that is that they are, are definitely in opposition to this location. And they are very worried about their property and their personal safety, uh, the cleanliness and condition of Wood Street. And many have shared pictures and personal accounts of property damage, vandalism, garbage, drug needles, and the like. And they have conveyed quite a few very strongly that they believe the camp will make their situation much worse. So I have been sharing that feedback with, with staff here within the city. And I just wanted to make sure that that feedback uh, also made it, made it to council. And uh, the specific feedback is available you know, upon request. So I just kind of wanted to share that and uh, feel free to, to ask any uh, other specific questions you might have on, on the camp. Or if not, I'll turn it back to uh, Simone. I have a question. Uh, actually, yes, I, I do have a, a quick question. So, you know, police police behavior, right? Um, and so the, the behaviors that you just mentioned, such as, you know, drug use, um, that's not going to be permitted um, if this site is approved. Am I correct? Uh, I, I might refer to that to Kim a little bit, but my understanding is not within the camp. The, the camp itself would be an alcohol and, and drug-free environment. Um, but I think the concern of the neighbors is the level of control for, for those that may be, uh, you know, just outside the fence. Um, so yes, Councilor Allen, um, it will be a drug and alcohol free site, violence free, weapons free, all the things for the safety of anyone that is there, including my staff. Um, Simone, I don't know if you want me to go or if you want to finish your slides. Um, it, it, you know, this is the challenge. This is the challenge on, on making sure that we validate the voices of our community at large and their concerns. And then the, the bigger and harder piece and to um, answer council uh, I'll care's question earlier, thinking outside the box is, is at some point we have to do an education campaign around homelessness um, because it's, it's in some ways it's a lack of understanding. It doesn't mean some of these things aren't happening because they are happening, um, but to get our community to understand the why behind it, the root causes, um, the, the, the brain function of someone in poverty, what trauma does to you, uh, the time horizon when you're homeless. I mean, there's all these factors that go into this. Uh, that, that not everyone um, can consider because they don't know. So not at fault at all, they just don't know. And so we will do our best and our messaging, you know, will be guys move away, 
move, move away as best you can. Um, and I can speak to, uh, Justin brought up transportation earlier and we've been doing some, some site stuff with it. Cause I did bring that up to him the first time we met at the site. Um, but I was wrong. Uh, our homeless friends are very clear that they are not going to be walking down Wood Street where um, it meets 219. That's not how they would access the camp. Um, they're going to access the camp through other, other means, including where they currently already are in Dairy Creek. And so, um, although I do understand the concern about traffic, I, I don't foresee it being a, a, a major problem um, walking by those residences because that's not how our friends are going to access this. And then the other piece is we will do our best to have transportation for folks from the camp to to other, you know, so to our day center, um, to sheltering, to, you know, to stuff. We'll shuttle people when necessary uh, to alleviate some of that as well. So uh, in other words, uh, Justin, you had mentioned uh, the folks in that area sending you pictures and stuff. Um, that's because those homeless folks are already there, right? I mean, that, so they're basically taking pictures of what they're currently seeing and not of what this facility would would provide. That's absolutely right. Yeah, they, they, they have all described that, you know, the situation there that they have encountered virtually everyone that I've talked to. And I think I've talked to most of those residents over the last week or so uh, have described, you know, that they've had break ins or, or vandalism of some kind, just about everyone. Um, you know, their concern is that it will, will in, increase with the camp. Um, but yes, they certainly are experiencing those now. Um, And sorry, one more question. Uh, sorry, Avich, go ahead. No, it's okay, Councillor Allen. It, uh, I'll, we'll, we'll discuss this later. To you. Okay. <laughs> one more quick question. So uh, it's, been, it's been some time, but uh, I visited a site in Eugene a while back that, um, that had these same kind of platforms. They had a cyclone fence around it and they had built this community in an industrial area. Um, and it was, uh, from my recollection, it was considered very successful. So have we looked at that site or other sites to figure out best practices and how we might improve our uh, go with this if we move that way? Yes, we refer have. <laughs> go ahead, Kim, I'll refer that one to you. Yeah, so yeah, we visited, we visited the same site. And if you've been there, um, you know that they have multiple sites where they've actually built on it. So you can, ha they have their campsite, um, and then it moves to more of a, a, a safe sleep type village. And then they have transitional housing and home ownership where folks are able to um, rent a place. Um, they're very small, but ultimately um, it turns into home ownership. So they have, they call it like villages. They have Emerald Village and different stuff. And so absolutely, I mean, I think it's really important to always take what's working around us, particularly someplace like Eugene, and, and bring those models um, to our communities to the best of our ability. And the other thing is it's a multi-pronged approach. I mean, one of the things that COVID did for us um, is it reinforced the need for multiple things um, because not all of our friends are gonna do all of our th the things. Not all of our friends are going to go to a day center. Not all of our friends are gonna go into shelter. Not all of our friends are gonna go into transitional housing right now. Um, hopefully at some point we can make it so appealing that they're gonna do it. And, and we have friends, I mean, we are basing this camp off of one friend that we know is going to thrive from having this camp. Um, we saw him do well at the village, which was at the fairgrounds. We saw him not do well in non-congregate shelters like the motels. We saw him do okay in a congregate setting, but what he needs is a safe camping site where he can know that he has a place to sleep every night, his belongings are going to be safe, and he has resources, some wraparound basic services there um, and outside. For his mental health and where he's at, that is what he needs. So it's one of the pieces of the multifaceted prong that, that we want to, to be doing because, because we know homelessness isn't a silver bullet. There isn't just one answer. Um, and so we have to be doing all the things. And so, you, you know, I mean, I guess, most of you know me. Um, you know, the question is, is yeah, I mean, there were there were break-ins and vandalism. Are we sure it was our homeless friends? Not saying it couldn't be, but are we sure? Um, this is Councillor Van Beveren. Could, could a case be made that 
creating a setting like this that's managed and um, clean and uh, supervised uh, actually uh, alleviate some of the problems that the neighbors have had with homeless people, let's say if they're if they are the homeless people that are creating this mischief, um, if they have a place like that to stay, they would have no need to go into the neighborhood and camp and that sort of thing. It seems to me, I don't know, but um, have we made that case? In, in respect to these, these, these residents, I don't think that we really have had just yet really too much of an opportunity to make that case. Um, you know, they, they, they heard about it just a short time ago and, and their reaction was, was, was they, don't, they don't like it. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to get a meeting set up with them over the coming weeks where we can start to talk more specifics and make some of those cases and outline maybe some uh, examples from other communities that have worked. Um, but, uh, you know, we've just got to get to that place where they're, they're willing to have you know, that level of conversation and um, to talk about things that can be done with implementation to make it a success uh, versus just um, just not wanting it, which, which so far is, is the feedback that we've gotten. So maybe real quickly, and we can come back to questions that, um, that Justin can answer and, and Kim can answer, because I know, Kim, you're going to give us quite a bit of information about how things will function. But I think it might be a good time to just talk about what communication has happened thus far. So the communication went out to those um, those property owners, those residences and businesses on May 10th. So the, those were mailed out on May 10th. Um, so, and that red area there is what Justin was referencing previously. So those are the, the folks that we heard from um, today and who have been contacting Justin quite a bit. Um, thank you, Justin. I know this isn't even your, your job anymore, but thank you for, for hanging in here with us. Um, and then May 17th, what, what day is today? So that would have been yesterday, happening in Hillsboro, um, website, social media channels um, are all about Hillsboro Facebook group. Um, all of that, all of those um, uh, mediums um, received the information about the site, about the work session, and about the city council meeting and the ability to provide public comment. Um, and then today, the letters were mailed out to that larger area where the boundary is in blue. Um, uh, Ciudad de Hillsboro um, Facebook page also received um, the information. And again, the city council work session is being recorded now so that um, it can also be placed on our YouTube channel um, so that people can access it at a later time or date that's more convenient to them. So that'll be posted um, May 19th. Um, I did check in with Patrick, and I think he is also on the line if I, if I um, somehow uh, misstate what he shared with me. Um, but the neighborhood concerns that, have, that are be, have been expressed to us about this site are not dissimilar from what other neighborhoods, neighborhood, neighbor concerns have been from other sites. So like the Safe Sleep Village, Neighbors that were that that um, proximal to to that site expressed the same concerns. Um, same thing for the winter weather shelter. Same thing for the Salvation Army um, sh uh, emergency shelter. So the the concerns are 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 these aren't new concerns. They're new to these individuals in terms of expressing them relative to to a a site a a a, a site related to homelessness. Um, obviously, they had these concerns previously, but now this has exacerbated um, their concerns. Um, in terms of what, so what are we seeing in terms of, of other communications? How are other people communicating about this news that we've put out on, on um, multiple, multiple media? So on Facebook, um, there's been really community-wide support generally. Um, Twitter, uh, Patrick expressed that the, there's a, an even stronger degree of support um, uh, via Twitter feed, um, and that with 1,300 um, web page views um, of the announcement, that, that that's ranking kind of like a Block 67 announcement or a highlight announcement. So, and that's a very short amount of time that that information has been out there, and so the community is interested. And, outside of the immediate area, and I'm not, I, I, I'm not saying this in a way that is, is trying to be dismissive of their concerns, 
but for those individuals not immediately impacted by, you know, at or, or feeling like they are immediately impacted, they have not expressed concern. So we haven't received emails or phone calls. That's not who Justin is hearing from at this point in time. That, that could change. And obviously we want to remain aware of that. And I know council has, has um, expressed to us very clearly that you want us to be transparent, which I think Justin has done an amazing job of, um, that you want us to communicate regularly and clearly. Um, Patrick and his team really assist all of us in doing that. Um, and so we just wanted to make sure that you, you know from our perspective that we are, we're hearing you on that and that we plan to continuously communicate um, not just as we develop the site, but as the site throughout its duration. Um, and Kim is used to working with us now. They have a long, uh, Project Homeless Connect has a long history of working with the city. Um, and they are very good about communicating to, uh, with us, not just challenges, but the successes. And there really are a lot of successes um, with the work that we have all done together. So um, with that, I will stop um, because I think the, the information that people are really interested in is likely how, how is the camp going to operate? Who's going, who, who is the intended, intended clientele or audience? And I think Kim is best positioned to answer those questions. Thank you, Simone. And we agree. We've loved working with the city of Hillsborough and every department and person and council. It's, it's been just such a wonderful partnership, um, including, you know, Justin, who is so new to this. And uh, it's been fun to educate him a little bit. And, and he asks great questions. And then some of your other um, teams coming in and making sure that we're critically thinking through some of the potential issues and just, and just all the things that we need to think of. So for us, um, you know, our goal is to, to have a safe place for people to camp so that they're not getting moved by the police so that they know where they can sleep every night, have a safe place for their belongings and be supported by staff with resources and those basic needs, the, the, that, you know, restroom facilities and hand washing stations and trash, trash, um, having a good place to put their trash. And so for us, it's, it's just meeting those basic needs and then coming alongside with the wraparound services. So having staff there 24 seven, making sure that we're doing some sort of case management and goal setting with them, making sure that community connect assessments are getting done and any goals that they set for themselves, small or large. So if it's getting their ID or vital records back or looking for you know housing, um, we wanna be part of that process and a walk, walk alongside them in that. We want a safe environment that is drug and alcohol free, weapons free, crime free. Um, and we've been able to execute this previously in, in all of our shelters and then at the village at the fairgrounds, which is very similar to the model that we're gonna be doing hopefully here at the Wood Street Camp. Um, we have a fantastic relationship with the Hillsborough Police Department, particularly our two CIT officers who Pat mentioned earlier, Rich and Mike have been nothing short of amazing. Um, and just the relationships they've built with our staff and also with our clientele um, has really just boosted the trust and interactions with police in general. And so that's just been really nice that um, homelessness doesn't have to be criminalized. It, it can be about relationship building and, and working towards helping people make better choices, um, depending on where they're at with their, uh, their story. Um, we will do our best and we are fighting hard, you guys, on this one. Um, we know it is critical to have mental health and addiction services connected to any program that we're doing. If it's a day center or outreach or sheltering, we have to have mental health and addiction services. They go hand in hand. So many times what we're seeing is our friends have a mental health condition and they are you know, sabotaging it because they're using drugs to self-soothe. Um, and so now we have you know, two issues that we're dealing with we will work towards bringing those services in house so that our guests, our friends um, have access to that if they want it. And what we've seen again with that is just about relationship building. The more often someone, um, mental health and addictions can come into, in this case, the camp and build those relationships, the more success we're gonna have. So we're fighting hard for that. And then also we have a ton of hope, um, You know, no guarantees, but we have a ton of hope with these supportive housing services funds coming in uh, from the Metro bond that we will be able to, you know, overstaff in some ways, fund some of these positions that we haven't had before, like mental health and addictions, um, make sure that uh, folks are getting the support they need to on their, on their, their path to housing. 
Um, Cause really it takes someone, a case manager walking alongside them through all of the pieces. And then even when they're in housing, continuing um, to be successful. But it's just a starting point. It's, it's, it's not necessarily out of the box thinking. It's just something that we haven't done here in this county. And um, you know, we want to validate the neighbors and their concerns because we understand it is scary and there has been you know, things that have happened. Um, we also know that it, it, they're, they're, they're already there. You know, I mean, you all know, we've talked about this. So many of our friends moved from McKay back to Dairy Creek. So they're already just down the street. Um, why not give them a safe place to be where they're actually monitored and they're in a, a managed camp where they're getting the support they need and the resources they need. And we will, we're, we wanna be low barrier in that we accept anyone that comes. So if you're in your addiction and struggling, you're welcome to come to the camp. You can't use on site, but you're welcome to come to the camp and we will do our best to get the appropriate services to that person to try to alleviate um, what they're going through. And so, you know, for us, it's, it's let's, let's do our best. No, again, no guarantees. We are going to outreach to those friends that are in Dairy Creek and they are deep in Dairy Creek and say, hey, listen, this is an opportunity you have. We want, you know, we want you guys here. We actually already have friends asking us about it because the word of mouth got out. Um, they're asking if there's a wait list that they can get on uh, because this excites them because some of our friends, again, multi-pronged approach, Safe camping is their desire right now, and it's what they need. And so we want to be part of that solutions. And we're just so thankful that council and Mayor Calloway, that you guys are willing to even have the conversation about championing um, this important issue and, and understanding that we are going to get some loud voices with opposition, understandably. We also have to be a loud voice for our homeless friends um, and make sure that they also have some basic needs um, around this. And then what we know from this past year is the ability to have some sort of sanitation, hand washing, um, trash disposal, restrooms, um, lowers the curve. Uh, COVID did not go rampant in our homeless population. And I think it's because places like the city of Hill Hillsborough championed shelter and day centers and, um, and those types of things. So I will take any questions. I know that was a brief overview, um, but I do appreciate spending, you know, very late Tuesday night with you all. Councilor. That's good, Kim. I'm, I'm very happy about this late night too. I'm, <laughs> this is a really important conversation to have. And so this, this whole thing is just, it's making me think about um, the sustainability of this. And that it's not just educating people to understand what homelessness is about. There's a two-way education piece that has to happen. Um, what I understand is we get a lot of um, feedback from people. They can just be driving by uh, and see something and not necessarily living next to it or working next to it, but um, people are troubled by it. And, and when they see that, and that is just mounting. But um, we're not just talking about adults, right? We are talking also about kids and families. So I um, want to be sure because we haven't really said too much. We're assuming that all families get sheltered, right? And that's not true. Um, so I, I think that there's a lot that has to happen with education and maybe here with the city that we could do a lot to um, do be engaged with that conversation that people have and do the education piece. But um, this is really hard for people who um, nobody's asking for this problem, right? Nobody's asking to be homeless. Nobody's asking to have to deal with homeless or be near homeless. However, you know, it disproportionately affects people in our city. And I think that is something that people are going to really focus in on because it, it's just so obvious. So there's a lot of education that needs to happen. And I truly appreciate all of your hard work. I really do. I, um, I, I don't know if I could do it. It's a hard job, right, to go into every day. But um, I, I at least maybe we can figure out some ways that we can help you that would make this easier for education. And, and we are incredibly privileged to do this work. We are incredibly privileged to know these friends 
and to know their stories and understand better why they're in the situation that they're in and they're heartbreaking, they're heartbreaking. And I've had multiple times where I've heard a story, um, the trauma that someone's been through. And, and in my mind, I can say, yep, you know what? I'm with you. I'd probably be using drugs too um, it, because that is just too, too, too horrible. And it's our job to, to bring some sort of compassion, kindness, and love um, and support them and, and then start moving towards, okay, how do we work through this trauma? How do we work towards self-sufficiency and, and move away from, from just, you know, trying to cover it up, which is so difficult. Um, so no, I appreciate that. And, and education is, is key on both sides. I mean, you know, we're doing a ton of messaging with our homeless friends all the time. Um, you know, guys, don't make it harder on yourselves. <laughs> this isn't helping. Um, and so uh, it, it is a two-way street and, um, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll continue to do the best we can. I do appreciate your kind words. Councillor Pace. Councillor Pace. Oh, sorry, Mayor, I'm not taking your job. Oh, no. Um, so Kim, th thanks for everything you've briefed and I love your passion. To flip it a little bit, um, and I was looking at my notes from the folks who were speaking uh, in, the, in the beginning of council. Um, there is going to be an increase in population in that area, right? If if we do this and we put the the, shell, the temporary shelter there, you know, one of the concerns was property values because it's temporary. That's not affected. But the other concern they had was theft issues, which we've talked about a little bit. Um, and just the feeling of unsafe and, and fear, right? So I was wondering, and maybe it's more of a question for Robbie, um, will we have, is it appropriate to have more police roll by um, and have a greater presence there? So that's first question. What are we gonna do to ensure the safety of the people who are already there? And frankly, paying taxes that are paying for this, right? I'm just, I'm, I'm not saying we shouldn't have it. I'm just saying we have to consider those folks too. They should be able to drive up to work and get from their car to the work to into their office without feeling that they should feel safe that whole time. So are we going to do anything for them? And then the other thing is, I totally understand why you, you wouldn't have drug use on the camp, in the camp, but would that force them to go off camp, meaning across the street from a, a business or down the street from a business to use in order to be out of the camp and, and follow that rule, but then that puts them on the street. Now, I'm not condoning drug use in the camp. I'm just wondering what are what can be done, if anything, to mitigate safety and drug use out, outside of the camp and, and safety for folks in, in the neighborhood already. Well, I'll tackle the first one, Kim, and then you can, you can tackle the second one. Um, so uh, you're absolutely right, Councillor Pace, and, and, and we've, we already, um, as I think Simone mentioned, we have had police involved from the get-go as we've been planning through this uh, this process. Um, and I would maybe refer everybody back to you know the the cold weather shelter that we had here at the Civic Center. I would point to that as a huge success. And we had a lot of we did increase patrols. Uh, we had increased um, presence from our police department. Um, that's not to say they will always be able to prevent anything from ever happening. But I think it was a, it was a show of success in then being able to do that. And I would also remind everybody too that this site is right next to our, our public safety training facility. Now that's primarily used for fire, but police, our police department is there all the time training. So it's actually from a public safety perspective, we will have a, 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 a very significant presence in the area anyway, and it will be increased even more uh, with this camp. Thanks, Robbie. You know, I can, I can, I can try, Councillor Pace. Um, you know what, Kim? At at ten, at almost eleven o'clock, you can punt and email me later. Yeah, I just, I, you know, I, I, I so desperately want to validate any concerns, mm -hmm. and I so desperately want to stop the stereotype of homeless being violent and criminals. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, so I, I, I live in this tension um, that we're constantly. Um, trying to work through and figure out. And so absolutely increased pres police presence. I think that's totally appropriate. And again, it's only been beneficial for all of us. Um, building those relationships with the police officers has been a beautiful thing for everyone, including my staff. I have a couple staff members who have very, very interesting criminal backgrounds and they were 
frustrated at first, you know, as police would show up because because Officer Matriciano would would join our staff meeting every Tuesday, and uh, and and over time, as the relationship built, they were like, oh, he's actually for for us. He's totally for us. He's doing a job, and he's for us. And it just alleviated so many things. And so, you know, we work towards that. <laughs> to answer your question, um, they're, they're already there using. I mean, this isn't, you know, it, it's, it's not necessarily that it's not currently happening because it's currently happening by testimony from tonight that there was needles and trash and those types of things. We're gonna try to do our best to help alleviate some of that by, you know, we'll have needle exchange coming to our site. Um, so that we'll have places to put those dirty needles. We'll have a trash um, disposal at the site for people to throw their trash away. Um, a safe place for people to be 24 seven, which Simone alluded to earlier, really big deal, you guys. We could have just done overnight camping to make sure people were safe overnight, but we're saying, no, let's be really intentional about this and give them a safe place 24 seven, which we know, again, from the village and our shelters, you give someone a safe place to hang out and be, that's where they're gonna be. Right. And it provides them stability, right? There's, there's, there's less upheaval in their lives, right? Yeah. So uh, less necessity to, to self-medicate, so to speak. So absolutely. I, you know, I mean, we get all the stories, we get the benefit of all the stories because we know these friends. And so we hear the stories where they'll say, you saved our life. You saved my life because I knew you cared. And I had to wake up the next day because I knew you were going to be looking for me. And it's those types of things that keep us going and want to make sure that we're putting all kinds of different programs in place to make it happen. And then also taking appropriate steps to make sure, you know, if it's building relationships with the neighbors um, or like the city's giving them a voice, it's so important. Increasing police activity, making sure that we're monitoring um, not just our physical campsite, but the area around us doing walk arounds and make sure that we know what's happening and where people are gathering and if they're on business property or walking through and, you know, so that, so that we can, you know, come at it from, from the beginning. It, it's not something that is told to us. We know about it and can say, hey, listen, hey, city, we have this issue. This is happening. How can we help work towards, you know, alleviating it? So it, it's all the things um, all at once. And, and we will do our, our darndest. You know, the Civic Center, thank you, Robbie. I would agree with you. It was, it was such a success. And the few times that we actually had to call the police it wasn't for people that were staying in our shelter. It happened to be people nearby. <laughs> I mean, it was this interesting dynamic for us because we're like, okay, well, you know, what just happened? Um, but, you know, it, it's again, back to the messaging on both sides, making sure that the community at large knows that we're going to increase police and our, our guests know that we're going to increase police activity over here. We're going to have them driving by and making sure everyone's protected. So, you know, do your best to... To, to move away if you need to do anything inappropriate. Okay, I, I, pre I appreciate that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? I do. Okay. I got two questions. I really appreciate the conversation about active engagement with neighbors. I think that's really important in the communication, education uh, on all parts, making sure that everyone in our city is fully aware of what's happening and how we're trying to address, like you say, our neighbors who are houseless. Um, one thing I've heard that is done, and granted, I don't know much about this, so if it's totally off base, let me know, is like a good neighbor agreement. So working with neighbors on trying to be able to establish something. Is that something we've considered at this site? Uh, I think that might be something that helps especially since it is a in terms of residences it's a fairly small number and then also being aware of the businesses as well and the folks who uh, who, who work there who spend a lot of their time there one of the things we did at our beaverton shelter which was a Fulton hills park and rec um, center and next door was a church um, which ultimately had a preschool in it and we went over and built relationships. We gave them a phone number so that they had a contact to call anytime. Anytime there was a situation where they felt uncomfortable, unsafe, pick a term, we wanted to be accessible to help alleviate those or have the conversation. We had a gentleman at that shelter who um, had pretty severe mental health and he would have episodes where he would just scream. Um, that can be really scary for someone, particularly uh, one of the workers would get to work usually before 7 a.m and it was still dark outside and there's a man outside screaming. She's like, oh my goodness, you know, I, I don't know what's happening. But we were able to communicate with her about our friend John and talk her through why John does what he does and when he does it and how we're gonna do our best to move John to a different area. And that diffused any concern. 
And we're just big fans of that. We're big fans of being accessible to any neighboring businesses um, or residents so that, so that, you know, A, you guys don't have to field all the calls if you don't have the answers. And um, our relationship building policy and the culture that we have is not just with our homeless friends. It's, it's with the community at large. We want to have relationships so that we can have these great conversations and go, okay, how do we work best together? Because we all live here. So let's, let's figure that out. Um, so we're totally open to that, whatever that looks like. Good, good. That's good to hear. Uh, the second part of my question, and I only have two questions. Um, or no, I have three, sorry. Uh, but the, the second one is about uh, services. So so you talked about all the services you would provide. And um, you, you talked about, you know, basic sanitation, water, a place for people to store things, to camp, to sleep. You then talked about mental health and addiction. And, and I just want to make sure what I interpret from you is mental health and addiction services will not be available there at the moment due to a combination of funding constraints and lack of staff capacity. Is, is that correct? That is, you, I mean, that was actually perfect wording. <laughs> right. That, I mean, you just nailed it. So we are in a, um, you know, a battle of, of whatever. Um, staff constraints are everywhere. Um, and so we are working with the county because we're looking at public health right now saying, hey, public health, we need you. We need you in some big ways. How do we make this work? And so we're having those conversations and then um, not to put all of our eggs in one basket, we know that the supportive housing services funds are going to help alleviate some of that. So come July or hopefully soon after, we'll be able to start funding those positions so that staff capacity isn't an issue anymore um, so that we can have those services. We do have relationships with Hawthorne and CODA, 4D, um, and all of our behavioral health, you know, uh, new narrative, Sequoia, LifeWorks as well. Um, it's been challenging in this year of COVID for some of, the, some of the services, but as we start to come out and restrictions are loose, loosened, you know, by the governor and stuff, we're seeing more activity from those partner agencies. And we know that, at, you know, at some point we're going to be able to engage better with those counselors and in, um, in those addiction services. Good, yeah, right. and I saw apparently on Friday, we're gonna move down to low in Washington County. So fingers crossed that helped. Uh, the other part I had with that about services, darn it, I do this a lot. I have a question and I don't write it down and I forget. Okay, then the other thing I was gonna say, I'll just skip it, is to talk about um, cost. I just wanna talk about what the cost is for this because we, we heard earlier, you know, the public uh, thing. So I just wanted to be able to talk about that also in relation what, what is the cost of this uh, for, for the city? What are we you know, spending? What, what, are, what are you all putting in, uh, uh, Kim and Project Homeless Connect? So Kim is not putting, put, Kim is putting their heart, soul and staff time <laughs> in. And, and we right now are working um, to gather all of the costs she's provided with us, us with a budget. Justin has um, done a great job pulling together vendor costs. We've um, made an attempt to, to kind of track our staffing costs as well. Um, and we'll be approaching com both community action and, um, and the county, particularly as the supportive housing services funding comes online in July. And so hopefully that, that bucket opens up, but they have, um, at least expressed um, openness to looking at other funding options to be able to contribute to this effort, so. Good, thank you. Uh, the final question, which I did remember, how will we measure success here? How are we gonna say that what we did, the investment we have in our community, the folks who were uh, benefited and folks who feel that they were neg negatively impacted, um, how are we gonna measure success to be able to say that this was a good thing that we did? Um. That's a hard one. Uh, that's a hard one just because for us, um, the way we measure success doesn't always end in the matrix of housing. And, um, and, and sometimes our measurable outcomes don't always end in housing. And so we take it person by person and, and relationship by relationship and say, oh my gosh, we were able to, this person I was talking about earlier, his name is Harry, and we've known him for a long time now. Um, success is going to be allowing Harry to be in a space that is good for his mental health, which ultimately will, will get him to a place where we can start working towards self-sufficiency. Mm -hmm. Success will be if clients need to get their ID or, you know, driver's license, uh, vital records together, getting community connect assessments done, 
Um, and then as we transition over to the supportive housing services, whatever their um, coordinated entry looks like, you know, participating in that with our friends. Um, success is going to be moving people into shelters and housing. We, we will have that. We will have friends that we can make that happen for, or they can make happen for themselves. Um, but it's, it, it's not going to be this overwhelming, oh my gosh, 90% got moved into housing. We don't foresee that happening because we have to understand the population that we are focusing on for this camp are our friends who are very clear that they want to be outside. That right now in the, in the situation they're in, um, they're not interested in shelter, they're not interested in talking about housing, um, potentially not even showing up at the day center. Uh, these are our friends that are currently at Dairy Creek, stuck in Washington, on TV highway, um, that we know are saying, you know, what I need is just a safe place to sleep. And, and we want to, to be able to do that for them and then figure out their goals and, and measure success in that way. It's, you know, Simone and I have actually talked about this. Um, right. staff, it's, it's, staffing it's, is our, biz, our, our, our largest by far line item, um, it, but it's necessary that we have, we have staff on site, at least two staff at all times, um, 24 seven, if we're gonna have a successful managed site. Um, it's important that we have staff coming doing case management. It's important that we have some of our outreach workers, which this isn't paying for, um, but our outreach workers engaging with our friends because they've already built the relationship over time by engaging them in the encampments that they're in. And so, you know, it, success is, is such a difficult um, thing to define. It's, it's the Civic Center, you know, it was open for 44 days and served more people in that time frame than any of the other shelters um, in the county because and it wasn't strategic, it just kind of happened this way. It was the coldest weeks of the year and we were to bring, we were able to bring people in, those friends that were like, I'm not going into shelter, I'm not going into shelter. And finally we're like, darn, it's cold, I need to get inside and bring them in and get them into safety. Um, and that's success. Hey, Kim, I, I'll say it, um, not dead. Right. Guys, that sounds, that's I, 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 yeah. Yeah. No. No. Oh no. I mean, you know, it's kind of different, right? You know, the severe weather shelter system started 13 years ago because someone in Hillsborough died of hypothermia. I mean, that was the the cause and effect. Was this happened? Let's do this. Um, last week, last Wednesday morning, um, very in the mor early in the morning, um, we received a phone call from one of our officers that one of our friends had passed away. Um, they found him at the Aranco NAC station. Um, we believe it was a drug overdose. Uh, he was young, he was desperate for help, and we failed him. And when I say we, I'm not just saying PHC, it was a system as, whole, and as a whole, the system is broken and weak, and we have great plans to, uh, to move that in a different direction. Um, but if, if I, I <sighs> not dead. Hang in there, Kim, hang in there. <laughs> I not, not dead is the dead. And, and it's a terrible thing I, you know but sometimes that's the i don't know you know your business better than i do sorry no i, I mean there, there's days there's days where we will repeatedly say to someone i want to see you tomorrow i need you to show up here tomorrow i need to see you and we make it selfish we make it about us because we need them to hold on to something tangible and go crap Kim needs to see me tomorrow, so I'm going to show up. So tonight, I'm not going to do X, Y, and Z because Kim is telling me that she needs to see me. That's success. They show up the next day and they're still alive. We're going to call that a success. Now, again, we're going to be able to move people to source towards self-sufficiency and get them into, you know, some of these programs that are coming online or even potentially housing. Um, and, and those will be great successes that we want to share as well. And we're also going to share the 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 goals that they've set for themselves that for you and I might seem small um, and call it success. Sorry, you guys. Yeah, I can talk all night about this. No, no. Alive, alive, uh, positive. <laughs> I, I think that helped and that gets to that larger trying to quantify what success means, recognizing that it is a continuum and celebrating and quantifying the successes that are across that continuum. So I appreciate hearing that. And that's that, that was really my goal is to make sure that we're recognizing all forms of success, not just a, this person got into permanent supportive housing or this person got into self-sufficient housing. 
Yeah, and, and we really we really strive for that. So one of the things we'll be doing at the camp is uh, our friends will do an intake form. And in that intake form is our list of guidelines. And it's pretty short and sweet because they don't have the capacity to remember all these rules. Um, it's our job to help enforce those. And uh, one of the things that they have to do is every 30 days, they have to re-sign that agreement because we're going to be setting some goals and we want to be working towards something. And again, those could be small things. This is not, <laughs> this does not have to be these huge tangible things, um, but that we have to be working towards something. Um, and, and so uh, every 30 days, we'll, we'll, we'll re-up with everyone and make sure that we're all on the same page. And, and in that case management, be you know, encouraging and pushing and nudging towards something better for themselves whatever that looks like. Kim, and, oh, sorry, ma'am. No. I was just okay. gonna, going to say, I think this is a really good, this, this is a, a good kind of return back to the original of the city council priorities and, and what even got us here and having the conversation with Project Homeless Connect and with community action about how to meet those priorities, how to make long-term investments, how to make change um, regionally, how to work with different partners. Um, and how do we tell that story? And so as we look at the ARPA funding and how do we utilize that? Do we utilize that to, to purchase a, a property um, and then convert that? And then we still at the end of that have to have outcomes that we're measuring. And I know we're gonna be talking to you about a framework um, next month for, but one of the recommendations coming with that framework is that, that we have some, some targeted investments towards, towards houselessness, but I think the rest of that conversation will also have to be about when, when community members ask us what the return on investment was, how do we tell that story? Um, and how do, we, how do we educate ourselves? How do we edu make sure that council is educated and that we as staff are um, another plug for our community services coordinator position being filled? Um, but you know, we can, we can assist council with being able to tell this story by doing community engagement, by being proactively communicating and being by, by being very transparent, not just in a site like this, um, but as we continue doing this, this work and, and having it move forward, because what we're hearing is that neighbors right next door who don't understand homelessness are really challenged. And even some people who understand homelessness are challenged, but the community broadly wants change and they want something different and they want different outcomes. So staff will continue to do this work um, and we'll make sure that we're utilizing funds in the most appropriate and effective way possible. So. Thank you, Simone. Um, so Kim, I, I thank you for your work and, um, and it's not just a current thank you, it's also a thank you, you know, going back. Um, and, you know, having volunteered with, you know, PHC, having seen former students and, and parents, you know, at different shelters, um, I understand the lifeline that is provided. Um, and I appreciate greatly the fact that, you know, the heart um, that you have and your team has for serving is matched by, um, I guess, a skill set that allows the results that we see, if that makes sense. Um, because sometimes we see folks who go in and their heart's in the right place, but there's not a skill set. And so the results fall short of where it might otherwise. So thank you very much for that. Um, one of the questions that came up earlier tonight was, where is the community betterment? You know, where, where is the advantage uh, and, and how is the community improved? And, and so to Councillor Martin's question about, um, you know, how do we measure success? I think a lot of what you said demonstrates the community betterment that occurs, you know, when we have safe places for people to be. And so um, I, I appreciate the answer that you provided for that. Um, you mentioned that uh, there will be, you know, opportunities for needle exchanges, which is good, keeps needles off the, you know, hopefully, you know, off the streets, off the fields. Um, you know, but is there, um, if, if people are going to use, and I know and recognize you don't have control uh, um, of the off-site beha uh, behaviors, but then I would, you know, whatever it would, however that message is delivered to, to our residents and friends, um, you know, that if, if, if drugs are gonna be used, don't go into the neighborhoods. You know, that's, um, you know, that's, uh, uh, you know, whatever, you know, that's 
fill in the blank, disrespectful, it's not cool, it's, um, you know, it's counterproductive, it hurts you and the work that we're trying to do on your behalf because you lose allies or potential allies. I mean, whatever the message is, and it may be individual for each person um, that's there, but um, that, that would go, I think, um, and address some of the issues of um, where drugs are being used and offsite behavior. Um, so with 30 people, uh, you know, with, with 30 pallets, if you will, um, how many people do we anticipate, um, you know, would be, would be served? Uh, what, do we anticipate that they're, you know, we're likely to see, you know, 80% of those pallets full on any given night? Um, you know, do you anticipate that we're frankly going to be full with 30, 30 individuals, um, you know, and, and uh, uh, so I guess that's one question. And then, you know, you know, for food and things such as that, that are provided, um, you know, is that just all packaged and processed or is it cooked and prepared, you know, and brought in or, you know, what might that look like? Your first question, our goal is to have 25 um, like set sites for folks. Um, and that would be at 100% pretty consistently. And, and, and although there will be a little ramp up time, we know that we'll get to that. And then we would like to have five beds available for hospital discharge and any police engagement. So if an officer were to find someone at the wee hours of the morning, um, and, and they were interested in coming to the camp, we would have a bed available for them or a tent available for them. So um, that is kind of our goal. We know, you know, with all the things, the shelters, the village, the civic center, uh, we get to 100% capacity within a short amount of time. And then, you know, you usually stay there depending on <sighs> turnover. And that, and that has so many factors to it that we could dive into. Um, and so our goal would, would be at, to be at very high capacity on a very regular basis um, because we want those friends that are, like I said, in Dairy Creek and on TV Highway and at Second in Washington to come and utilize this camp um, instead of those public spaces. Um, food and stuff, it's a, it's, a, it's a combination of all the things. And so we try to make sure to have what feels like a home cooked meal for friends partnering with Sunrise Church, as you well know, Steve. Um, and then also uh, other items, snack, you know, to go items. We have a bunch of churches right now that are re-engaging in their volunteer opportunities. Their small groups are starting to meet up again and they're looking for ways to volunteer. And so like today we picked up 50 sack lunches from one of them um, to have readily available for um, our day center engagement and stuff. So it's, oh, it's a wide variety of a lot of different things. And then our friends are, pretty self-sufficient in their own ways. Very good, thank you. Um, I think, you know, looking at the time, I think that's, I'm, I'm good with that. And I appreciate, I appreciate you sticking with us. Um, you know, Justin, um, you know, Pat, Simone, everybody. And uh, so, oh, Robbie, one last thing, I guess one of the comments that was brought up is that, you know, that this would violate multiple municipal codes. Um, can you address that as to whether or not it violates multiple or any single single code? Absolutely, yeah, the, uh, everything we're doing is in line. Uh, uh, as Justin mentioned earlier, there's um, a temporary use permit that would be issued. Justin, hop in if I get any of this wrong, but uh, we'd be in line with, with uh, uh, our codes to do this. Um, also, from a budget standpoint, we have budget um, already identified, you know, to be able to, to work with this. So, uh, we're, we believe we're in line with everything we need to be. And the temporary permit is consistent with what we've done when we cited this at the Civic Center, um, when we cited it, um, you know, at the uh, Salvation Army uh, during this last summer. Um, so, these types of temporary permits um, you know, again, with the RV site over at the uh, fairgrounds, as well as the safe, the safe camping site, each of those has, um, you know, had the, the, the permitting necessary. So none of these things have been um, outside of or in violation, conflict, whatever, with municipal codes. Okay. Correct. Justin, did you want to say something on that, too? Uh, no, th that's, that's correct, uh, Mayor Calloway. Um, We've, we've really tailored the scope of the work 
to make sure that we're not triggering, you know, land use or development triggers that would require uh, further process. The camp that's proposed now doesn't meet any of those triggers, so it would be covered, well covered under a temporary use uh, permit. Now, the temporary use permit is good for 90 days, uh, upon which time extension uh, requires a trip back to council uh, to approve that extension. Okay, thank you. All right. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council. Um, we so appreciate you being champions for this important issue and taking the time to talk this through. Um, Simone asked if I wanted to be on for the entire meeting, and she said, you know, I can just text you when it's your turn. And I decided to stay on for the entire meeting, um, which was very informative, and it just shows the um, scope of work that you guys do and all the things that you're part of and your dedication to the city and making it better for everyone. So thank you for all of that. And I learned about things that I probably would have never known about. Um, uh, and we just, you know, we're, we're excited to partner with the city again and continue to, um, to help our homeless friends in whatever ways we can. Thank you. Simone, last words? Um, just, I will also want to extend my thanks to, to Kim and um, just say that, that the, the folks that are your friends are our friends. Like this is the, the city of Hillsboro, just like we say, one city, one voice. This is one community and, um, and we're all here to serve and make sure that all of our community members are safe. And so we really, I appreciate working with you and the partnership that you help bring and, and it's how it's helped us even with our partnership with the county. So just thank you for making time and for Pat and Cecilia and Justin, and thank you for your continued work doing project management and in council with any questions that you may have regarding this, please feel free to reach out to me um, and I will find answers when, when you need them. Very good, thank you.